Welcome back to the Cross Board Interview Podcast. Today, we are sitting down with Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 11, Lauren Herschel. Lauren, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Lauren, uh, I, I start off all my interviews with the same question to any political candidate. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, that's a good question. You know what? I haven't been asked that one before. Um, I'm, I'm a helper, I think, by nature. Um, you know, I was the kid, you know, rescuing bees from the swimming pool and, and that sort of thing. Volunteering is really important to me. Um, and then in this particular case, I think it's because I moved to Calgary 15 years ago. I was very reluctant to move here, you know, full disclosure. Um, and then I moved here and I fell in love with the city. And I think, you know, I've had wonderful opportunities here. I think the people are fantastic. I just love the city a lot. And so to me, this is a excellent way to extend that affection and give back to the city by using my skills and experience to hopefully improve things and, you know, make other people fall in love with the city. Now, you can give back in many ways. You can give back through nonprofit organizations. You can give back by volunteering. But in 2021, you have decided you were going to put your name forward for municipal elections, for municipal politics. Uh, you probably get this question a lot, but I've got to ask it to follow up with the th statement you just said. Why now? Why put your name forward now? What at this crux in time have you said, we need to address this because I, I feel like we are falling behind on it? I think right now it's as much as it's a bit of a, a wild and crazy time, it's a perfect time. I think people are, you know, we've been through so much in the last, um, you know, couple of years of the economy or a number of years of the economy and then of course um, COVID um, that I think people are ready and, and open to change. And I think sometimes what's that saying? You have to strike when the iron is hot. I think right now, there's an appetite, there's an openness to change. Um, so it's a really good time to get in there and possibly be able to move the needle a little bit, not more easily, but um, I think maybe more collectively and people, um, pe people are engaged right now too. You know, And I don't think people are terribly unhappy, but I think there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think when you have a really engaged population, people being open to change, um, and we've just gone through a year that's demonstrated that things can, you know, change in a minute and keep changing repeatedly. Um, I think we've shown how adaptable we are. So to me, this is just a, it's a really good time because we can extend what we've learned about adapting over the last couple of years and really translate that into some um, positive improvements with the city. Now, when you're talking to residents of Ward 11, and uh, I'm assuming you're talking to ward, uh, residents of Ward 11, and if you're not, you're probably going to be starting <laughs> yeah. here soon. Um, are you hearing that? Because when I talk to residents across the city, I hear that they, people want change, but they don't know what change means. So when you're talking to Ward 11 residents, what are they saying about what needs to change? Because that is probably the biggest question that everyone wants to address is, how do we change without really knowing how we want to change in this uncertain time? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, there's different people with different opinions out there. Um, I think one of the common messages I've been hearing, um, and I'm sure, you know, many people you've talked to have heard the same thing. Um, it's, it's that economic recovery, or what I like to say is economic health, because I think that's a step past recovery. Um, you know, and, and in some cases, some people are more focused on taxes, other people are more focused on service. Um, you know, there's a lot of small business owners that want a little bit more certainty brought back into the processes and what they're going through. Um, you know, so I think that that's sort of a, a larger umbrella that a lot of ideas and opinions um, sit under. A lot of people do have very definite ideas on how things should change, whether or not those are the best routes or what will work in a long term way um, might be a different story. But I think, you know, people are definitely putting thought into how to how to make those um, problems better or how to create more opportunity. So I think those are sort of key things. And then, and then of course, you know, there's just like the really micro community level things that people are concerned about, like safety and um, you know, we, Ward 11 is, um, is a collection of aging communities, you know, we're all kind of middle-aged, anywhere from, you know, built in the 50s to um, 70s, early 80s, in most cases, there's a few pockets that are a little newer. Um, so, you know, there's some wear and tear that's showing. So that's, that's obviously a focus too, when you walk out of your house and you see a broken sidewalk or there aren't curb cuts, things like that. So it's kind of a mix of that, you know, overall the city's economic health, but then, you know, help me be able to get around my neighborhood better, help me, um, you know, make sure that the roads are safe for my kids to cross.
I, I want to talk about that a little bit more in depth here. Um, any candidate will have a list of priorities that they believe needs to be addressed at council. Um, but when they start talking to residents and they start talking to uh, the people that they want to represent, they hear, like you said, a vast majority of opinions and things that residents want. When you're talking to residents of Ward 11, are you hearing things that you haven't really thought of or said, hmm, I never thought that this was a priority for people, but I'm glad people are talking about it because it makes us a greater community when we have an open dialogue with a large amount of people. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Um, I think I think for me, I feel like I'm aware of most issues, but I think in talking to residents and business owners, um, they've given me examples and perspectives within those issues that maybe I hadn't thought of. So a really great example, um, and I'm sure it, we've all heard this, snow clearing is, you know, even though it's, it's boiling hot out right now, snow clearing is still top of mind for people. And, you know, I'd always heard the main things like, you know, um, being able to access intersections and some of the side streets not being plowed and, and like the, those sorts of um, really obvious things. But I was speaking to a lady the other day who lives actually in my community and she's in a cul-de-sac that uh, I guess in the 1970s, we thought cul-de-sacs didn't need sidewalks. Um, but what that means is because those super side streets don't ever get plowed and there is no sidewalk for residents to, sho to shovel, that means that anybody who has, you know, balance issues, mobility issues, um, maybe doesn't drive, are essentially trapped until the snow melts enough that they can walk on their street. So I hadn't thought of it at sort of that level. I'm focused on, you know, oh, they plow and then they create those, um, you know, Windrows? what are they called? Yeah, they create those and, you know, you see people trying to hurdle over them in the winter. And, you know, obviously those are a concern, but it didn't occur to me that, you know, a street of 24 houses could essentially, depending on the mobility of those people, you could be trapping, a, uh, you know, 24 households in their homes until we're lucky, lucky enough to get a Chinook or, you know, 311 is called and they're able to clear that street. So it, um, you know, and we all know that the ice sticks around for a while. So it's just that sort of, you know, I thought, oh yeah, it's hard to cross the street, but this is a case of not being able to get out of your house. Yeah. So um, it, it's little things like that where I think it's really, it, it really gives you perspective on the extent of how some of those issues affect people. Now on your website, uh, laurenherschel.ca, and for my viewers and for my listeners, the link to Lauren's website will be in the show notes. So if you want to learn a little bit more about Lauren, please click on the link and go and learn and just figure out uh, what if you want to contact her, her contact information is, is there as well. You have key priorities on your website, and I want to talk about a few of them here uh, specifically. And I want uh, you have economic health, investing in Calgary, affordability, and accountability. I want to start with the economic health part because there's a part on your website, and it, I'm going to read it verbatim for those who, uh, who haven't read it and are listening to this or watching this. But we need to focus, and this is your website, I'm quoting here. We need to focus on not only taking steps to strengthen our economic health, but continue to look for ways to innovate and run the city operations more efficiently, end quote. Now, any journalist will follow up with the, what's not being efficiently done? And I'm going to ask that question to begin with, but I'm going to ask some follow-ups as well. So to begin with, what do you see as not being run efficiently at City Hall right now in the operations section? And not saying just operations as in snow removal, but the entire operations yeah. of City Hall. So I, I think there's a few things. Um, I've heard from residents, I've heard from businesses, um, and I'm not in any way you know, picking on specific departments because I know in every department there are really awesome people who are doing really, you know, good work. Um, and I think sometimes there's policies or rules that mean that there's all these extra steps that have to be taken to, um, you know, to, to help people get to where they want to be. So um, because I have a, a fair bit of experience working with the planning department, um, you know, there's, there's situations where files basically get passed from department to department to department and back to planning. And it becomes almost like that telephone game where by the time you get approval from the last group, the first group is unhappy with some of the changes that have been made along the way. Um, and to me, I mean, that, that's just not efficient, right? Because then you start all over, there may be, and, and 
you know, don't get me wrong, people submitting applications, they expect that there's going to be changes, but when there doesn't, when there isn't that predictability with, you know, here's, if we follow these a hundred steps, we'll probably get an approval like that, that isn't efficient. And I'm pretty sure, you know, a lot of people working in that department, they don't want to be looking at the same um, file kind of going around the merry-go-round for months and months and months. So I think, it's, it's finding maybe some efficiencies in how we're doing it, um, making sure that there's the ability to like, I don't know, have like a stopwatch and say, okay, everybody has to make their changes by this. And then, you know, then that's that. So that's one particular area. I think um, another area doesn't really have to do with how much we're spending on operational stuff um, or how much in taxes we're bringing in, but it's how we're managing those, for lack of a better term, different buckets of money. So, um, there was an investigation done um, on this, the, the city did it themselves last year. Um, and late last year, early this year, they discovered they had been misallocating interest from um, a particular fund that the interest was supposed to go back in the fund as happens, right? Like with our bank accounts, we get interest, it goes back in. They had been misallocating that interest for 14 years and it hadn't been caught. And it, was being put into general revenue, which in my mind is two issues. One, they were misallocating interest. Like that's pretty basic, it should happen. Um, and I don't think it's current day finance people that were doing it. I think it was just something that got missed along the way. Um, and then also they didn't notice that there was this extra money in general revenue. So if that was found in sort of one corner of the city's finances, is that replicated elsewhere? So I think, you know, it's looking at, um, it's looking at how are we doing that? You know, are we using the best programs? Um, is there that accountability at the department level or is somebody unfortunately having to do things off the side of their desk? Like how do we make sure that how we're managing those funds um, is airtight? Now, one of the biggest things that the next council will have to address literally within the first month and a half is the budget. The budget is a multi-billion dollar entity. Yeah. And while it's great that you want to look at uh, potentially other issues that are in the budget, where uh, interest is going, uh, where the revenue sources are coming from, how do you do that in such a short period of time? Because Calgary is a weird entity and uh, I've only worked for municipalities who've done year to year budgets, not a four year budget. So how do you look at those while looking at the four year plan? Because let's be honest, four years from now is going to be completely different from November and you're going to have to try to deal with yeah. budgets every year, but work on a four year budget within your first month. <laughs> Yeah, which is which is excellent. I mean, you know, dive in and, and get in there. Um, I think they're two separate things. So I think, like I said, the the issue with how money is being managed, it's important, but I would never expect anybody to even be able to look into that in a couple week period. Like that's just not possible, right? I, I think even with our own finances, our own personal finances, like that would take a couple weeks. So let alone the city. So I don't have an expectation that that's going to be looked at. And there might not be any problems. I'm just I'm flagging that there was this one problem that went undetected for a long time. So perhaps it, you know, exists elsewhere. But I think with the budgets and the um, taxation issue, I think, you know, most of council is going to be new. I think we're going to have to go in there. Um, learn very quickly, really understand what the different services are that the city offers, really understand where um, those operating dollar asks are going to. Um, and, you know, I think that you're, I would have to establish very quickly some really great working relationships with various different departments so that I could understand, um, you know, what their needs are, what their wants are, and really also what's in front of them. Um, you know, some departments have projects, they're very project based. So, um, that's a little bit different than, you know, somewhere um, like roads where it's, you know, you have fairly steady repairs every year that you have to do. So I think it's really, it's the, the onus is on the new council to really learn as quickly as possible. Um, and, you know, hope that we make the best decisions. Um, I would suspect to, I mean, yes, it is a four year plan, but I would suspect just given the nature of the uncertainty with Calgary in general, because we're still coming out of COVID and all that, I would expect there's gonna be some amendments in the coming years. Um, and I think that that's totally reasonable as we see what is needed, as we, you know, kind of get back to this new normal, um, you know, hopefully the economy starts, you know, turning up a little bit. So, um, you know, I think we have to give it our all in, in November, knowing that um, 
there may be some tweaks that have to be made over the next four years. I, I want to talk about the future because we are talking about economic health and you've hit the hammer on the nail there is COVID-19 has decimated budgeting for the future because we are still uncertain what the recovery is going to look like. Yeah. Uh, and the last year and a half has put a hamper on city finances because we've had to close facilities and that still costs money, even though they're not open. And residents are still feeling the struggle of the economic downturn of the oil and gas industry. And now they have the COVID-19 to recover from as well. So we hit it with the double whammy. How do you envision the next council, yourself as the representative for Ward 11, to represent everyone and make sure everyone gets a fair shot at recovery from both pandemic and the economic downturn. Because you talk to people, while they are optimistic about the future, they're, right now they are not because they are struggling day to day, week to week, paycheck to paycheck. So how do you envision everyone getting ahead in a uh, next term council? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, as much as people are optimistic about the future, that doesn't pay your mortgage. So it, um, it, it, I think it's, again, it's about forming those relationships. And I think it's about forming those relationships with people in the communities, um, you know, maintaining the relationships that I've made already just through door knocking and talking to community members and business owners. Um, and I think, you know, I think it just really comes down to listening um making sure that we're listening and we're capturing what everybody needs and wants and we're making sure that there aren't any as best we can there there isn't anybody left behind so i think it's um you know really looking at um how is the energy industry doing and you know are they um uh, hopefully not but are they sinking lower are they kind of holding steady are things coming back on um what can we do to help the displaced employees like is there another industry for them is there something that you know the city can offer in terms of like a skills upgrade um those are just like i those are just you know particular ideas um you know what industries are thriving because um there there have been a few industries in the city that have done very well um over the last um and, and not because of covid like it's not their business isn't reliant on covid obviously but they they have been thriving over the last 18 months so um you know what opportunities are there there because i know that there are industries that are hiring a lot of people and they're actually struggling to find the right skill set so i think it's maybe just doing an inventory of where we're at from an economic perspective, um, you know, where Ward 11 residents are at. Um, we have a fairly varied population, um, but just understanding, you know, um, what are their challenges um, in terms of employment and that sort of stuff. And then, um, you know, it's hard to offer solutions now without knowing what those challenges are, but, um, you know, making sure that they have access to the resources that they need. Um, and then also just the community support, because I think, um, I've, I've had a few different times in the last six years where I've been laid off. And I think, um, you know, while community can't necessarily get me a job, knowing that I'm supported by my neighbors and my friends and that, you know, even something as simple as like having um, something that's affordable to go to from a recreation standpoint, like that, that helps you get through those things. So making sure that those things are also still accessible um, for those people and their families as well. Now, I, I hate to keep on this economic health uh, issue, but I think it is the most important uh, factor that we are going to be facing in over the next four years. One of the biggest things that council has to remember is while you represent your ward, and I'm not talking about mayor, but councillors, while you represent your ward, you have to represent the city as well. You are there to represent all of the city. And sometimes you have to vote for the best of the city. And sometimes you might have to vote against something that might not come to Ward 11, might not come to your ward. How do you envision working in that scenario? Because while you are there to represent, you are elected there, you are elected by the rep uh, residents of Ward 11, you have to represent all of Calgary. So how do you envision working with Ward 11 residents and saying, you know what, I'm sorry your road didn't get paved, but we had to worry about this one because it's a little bit more in disrepair compared to this road. And looking at the cul-de-sac issue, hey, we would yeah. love to have sidewalks on your uh, in, in your cul-de-sac, but this is more important at this time yeah. and we hope to get it here soon. So how do you, how do you envision balancing that out? 
Well, I think even just in your example, you highlighted the most important thing and that's the communication factor. Um, it's having those conversations with people. I think that isn't done enough. I think it's selectively done at times um, and that's tough, right? If, if people only loop you in um, occasionally, um, you know, I think if we're being honest um, and it's not necessarily the fault of current council, but I think there's a lot of distrust in all levels of government right now. Um, even by the, you know, even by the most pro-government of people, there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty and there's a little bit of mistrust because we've had, um, we've had a rough few years and there's been, um, you know, a lot of um, partisanship and a lot of infighting. And I think a lot of people are just, they're tired and they want to trust, but it's been difficult. So I think, I mean, the key to trust is having good communication. So I think making sure that, at every given opportunity, I'm explaining the why behind things. I'm giving people data, you know, I'm showing them pictures maybe of the road that needed to be fixed above this particular road, but then also managing expectations like, hey, you know what, we will get to this, but it's not gonna be this year, it's gonna be next year. Um, and, and being able to give them, again, some of that predictability that they're being heard, their, their concerns are valid, but we just can't get to it until such and such a time. And I think that is really the key to helping people understand that, you know, and I think most people honestly do get it that, you know, we are a city, we're not um, a collection of tiny little cities, you know, or, or wards. Um, we all trap, most of us travel outside of our wards. So I think it's, again, just reminding people of that and that, um, you know, we have to take care of each other and we have to take care of the city as a whole. Now, this, this, it, it, your, your, your comment there just segue into the next set of questions perfectly, which is accountability and transparency. Yet again, on your website, laurenherschel.ca, I'm quoting here, quote, misinformation costs the city as well as residents time and money. It creates division between stakeholders and it can take longer for important decisions to be made, resulting in missed opportunities. How do you envision, end quote, sorry, how do you envision working with everyone to ensure that that misinformation is out, uh, not out there and tackling it because the a lie can take five seconds to uh, go around the world and the truth can take about a week. So how do you envision battling back of that misinformation that is out there on certain projects and certain files that might be important to your ward? No, a hundred percent. And again, I think it comes down to that communication. Um, I'm a very transparent person. I mean, you know, ask me something and I will probably answer you like maybe a little bit too honestly, but I think it's when you establish that trust and people understand who you are um, and you have a demonstrated, I mean, I have a demonstrated track record, you know, prior to even being on council of being an honest person and being a vocal person um, and, you know, communicating clearly. So I think bringing that forward, um, you know, I think that that really does help with that accountability and transparency. In terms of misinformation, um, you need to call it out. You need to call it out respectively, like it, it should um, respectfully. It doesn't need to be a, you know, me versus that person. Sometimes people just don't have the right information or they've interpreted it in a different way. And so I think it's making sure that, again, you're having those transparent conversations um, and you are presenting, you're not just saying that's wrong, that's misinformation. It's, you know, this is, this is how I see it. This is why I see it this way. Um, you know, and this is, it, this is why it's important that we do ABC. Um, and again, I think it's, it's sometimes, I think sometimes the misinformation gets put out there and you're absolutely correct. Lies seem to fly through the world faster than the truth does sometimes. But I also think that a lot of people don't want to wade in um, because they're afraid of, you know, it costing them in some particular way, or they're afraid of, you know, the backlash on them. And it's going to take energy. And of course it does. But I think we've seen what happens when you turn away from it and you just let it faster. So I think it's making sure that we stand up to that and also holding my fellow counselors um, accountable for that too. You know, having conversations saying, hey, you know, this is not helping. This is the wrong information. Here's the right information. And just um, just helping people understand the, the cost of those missed opportunities. One of the things that when I talk to residents across the city and even some residents in Ward 11, I hear that there's a disconnect between residents and uh, the people at City Hall 
whether it be counselors, whether it be administration, whether that be the information not being communicated, like you said, to the people or uh, the truth or misinformation being spread a little bit faster than uh, the truth. How do you envision building back a, and I hate to use Joe Biden's word here, but how do you envision building back a better relationship between residents and counselors? Because while communications is great, some people just won't listen to you. And I think you are aware of that. I think people have to be aware that while counselors can talk and talk and talk, some people just won't listen. So how do you build back that trust between people and counsel? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a long game. Like you have to, you have to put the work in. Um, I think you have to show up where people are. Um, yeah. Like I, I think we're, I mean, I, I have a communications background and I would be completely delusional if I thought if I just posted this to the website, I can check a box, right? Like, because people don't necessarily read, they don't know it's there, that sort of thing. So I think you need to find you need to find the tools to get to people as much as you can and hope that they read. Um, but then also find different ways of having conversations like this, or, um, you know, some people don't read stuff, but they'll listen to a podcast. Um, some people show up to community meetings. Some people might write, um, you know, a, a grumpy email about something and it's making sure you reach out quickly to them and you arrange a phone call or whatever's going to work best for them. Um, and it's a lot of legwork, but I think, if you don't do it, you don't establish that trust. Um, and I think from a council perspective, that's really important. I also think um, one thing I've heard in particular, um, and you know, this is not a slight at my current counselor, but there are certain communities that feel underrepresented um, in the ward. And then other ones think that, you know, um, the current counselor is very attentive. So to me, um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, you know, I can't speak to those, re those reasons, but obviously counselors can be spread fairly thin, but I think it's important that, you know, I keep an awareness of, you know, have I been leaving anybody out or has it been a while since I've talked to this community association or I've been to an event in this particular community um, and making sure that, you know, I, seem just as accessible to someone living in Fairview as I do to someone living in Oak Ridge. I want, I want to word this question correctly because I, I feel like it's an important discussion that we're having right now. Um, you will have to, uh, you will have to represent people that might disagree with you and you might disagree with their opinions on way things that need to be addressed at City Hall. How do you envision working with people that you may disagree with or they want something addressed that you may not completely 100% be behind, but as their counselor, even though you may disagree with them, you have to voice their concerns at City Hall as well? No, 100%. Um, and that that is somebody I, something I stress to people every day. I represent everybody, not just the people who think the same as me, not just the people who you know, enjoy the same things as me. Like I really do represent everybody in Ward 11. And, um, you know, and sometimes there are gonna be a lot of different viewpoints and it's a matter of bringing those viewpoints together and being able to, yes, express the ones that um, may not be in line with the majority. Um, I've had conversations in this campaign process with people all over the spectrum, all different kinds of beliefs, all different kinds of opinions on issues. And I've taken, I can honestly say, I have taken away a, a, a useful perspective from every single one of those conversations where I can incorporate something that someone um, believes, even though if I don't believe on it, in their particular solution to something, I've looked at it from a different way so I can incorporate something into the solution that maybe addresses some of their concerns. And so I think it's just continuing to have those conversations, again, continuing to be accessible um, and understanding that no one wins if it's like team A versus team B. No one wins if, if we are only listening to the loudest voices in our community. So I think, again, it's me putting in the work and making sure that I am hearing and actually hearing what people are saying and what they're concerned about um, and bringing those concerns to the table. Now, I, I'm just cautious of time here because we are hitting the 30 minute mark and I don't want to keep you long, but I have a few other topics I want to talk about and then we'll wrap up here if that's okay. I want to talk about affordability. Affordability is one of the things that is going to be uh, important as all get out 
as of uh, October 19th. We are seeing house prices climb. We are seeing wages stagnant. We are seeing people unable to afford living. In, they, they, are, they have to sell their house to live in rental properties because they can't afford property taxes, uh, mortgages, and all that. How do you envision making Calgary a more affordable place for people to live, to work, and, and I, I hate to use this word, but to play in, to go out and yeah. use the programs? How do you envision that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's not a magic wand that you wave and makes that make that all work. It's kind of an ecosystem, right? You have to have everything needs to have the balance for yeah, and and we will be out of balance sometimes. I mean, that's just the nature of the economy in the city. Um, I think, you know, I, so I think if I obviously property taxes are an issue. I think they're an I. I know some people think that they're very fair and and they're great, and then other people struggle, and so I don't think that you know it's one is right and one is wrong. Um, I do think that our current property tax system is not set up to really be sustainable when the economy isn't fantastic. I think it was a, a plan that was built around, you know, having a strong oil, energy costs, that's or energy prices, that sort of thing. And I think it's, um, it's proven that in times of uncertainty, um, it isn't great. So what we keep doing is we're passing the hot potato back between um, homeowners and commercial property taxes, which affects um, affordability um, for homeowners, but it also affects um, affordability for businesses, whether those are retail businesses, restaurants, you know, or even um, corporations, you know, paying for industrial land, that sort of thing. So I think um, finding a better solution for paying, I mean, obviously property taxes are brought in to pay for our operating costs. So finding a better solution for that is going to take more time, but I think it is something that needs to be looked at. Um, in terms of housing affordability, um, to me, housing affordability and choice goes hand in hand. So a lot of Ward 11 communities, um, again, built 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and there wasn't the priority put on things like um, aging in place, multifamily homes. Um, I'm not against single family homes. I live in a multifamily home myself, but I think it's, um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of residents who are in single family homes in some of these aging communities and they have nowhere to go as they're getting older um, because they maybe can't or really don't want to be paying the property taxes they are. It's a lot of um, financial costs to maintain a larger home, but they feel like there isn't anything for them in the area where they can move that is, you know, smaller or better size for them, one level. So I think, it, so that becomes a, a choice and an affordability issue. So to me, this solution, I think it's going back to how we're planning the city. Um, 50% of our growth is supposed to happen in established areas, and that's not currently happening. Um, and in that particular case, you know, most of that's going to be multifamily. Um, and then the edge of the city, I know people have some concerns with growth there, um, but they're doing the best job of making things affordable and giving housing choice and, um, you know, having, having those sort of mixed communities where um, there's a little bit more balance. So I think it's, looking for ways to balance those two out. Um, and then, um, and then, like I said, you know, just working with um, Calgary's businesses, whether there's, you know, it's the small mom and pop shop at the end of the street, um, or it's, you know, a larger corporation um, that's investing a lot of money in, in growth in Calgary, it's making sure that they have, um, you know, an ease of doing business, they have um, some predictability as well, like they're not jumping through hoops that then turn into other hoops, and that it's, it's very clear on how they need to interface with the city. And I think when you have a lot of, uh, most of those things taken care of, you're gonna see greater affordability overall because if the companies are doing well, they can employ people and then people are employed, then you know they can afford to do things and they can afford various different recreation um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then yes, you did mention uh, sort of those services, the, the play aspect. I think it's making sure that we still have um, you know, low cost or free things like the library, like some of the city's recreation facilities, that we have things like the low income transit passes for people who really need them, the fair entry program for people who really need them. Um, just so again, we maintain that balance um, and things are as equitable as possible across the city as we do grow. One of the areas that uh, the next council will have to work on is 
attraction and retention, attraction of new businesses, attraction of new residents, attraction and retention of said businesses because of the pandemic and the uh, global economic downturn, people are leaving and residents. How do you envision working with the next councilor council to do that? How do you envision retaining our current population, retaining the children who are leaving to go to university and not coming back, retaining the businesses that are here and attracting new businesses because Calgary is not a unique ship in this uh, uh, global pandemic and the economic downturn. Other municipalities are in the same boat and they're doing the exact same thing we're doing. How do you envision us doing it differently and attracting new people to and businesses to our community? Yeah, I mean... I it, it might sound silly, but I think a lot of it comes down to sort of looking at ourselves in the mirror and, you know, what do we look like to um, people outside of the city? Um, you know, I used the example at the start, um, I was kind of reluctant to move here. I grew up in the Toronto area. Um, I had never been west of Windsor. I'm, I'm totally, I was that total obnoxious Ontario person. I've changed. Um, but I, I have it, too, as a former Torontonian <laughs> as well, I have yeah. too. <laughs> But I think, you know, I don't think I had even the slightest understanding and I consider to be myself to be an educated person. I read a lot, you know, I didn't realize that Calgary had as many cool things as it had. I didn't realize that it has the art scene that it has. I didn't realize, and, and I mean, it's exponentially grown since, you know, 2006 when I moved here. I didn't realize that there was, um, you know, really cool restaurants and really cool neighborhoods. And then, you know, of course I knew about the mountains because geography, but I, I don't think I realized, you know, all the different things you could do. And I think, I think one of the things um, we really need to do is do a better job of telling our story. And then also looking to see where are we maybe not so cool anymore? Um, and what do we need to do to fix that? Like, what do we need to invest in to fix that? I think, you know, strengthening, for example, our transit system um, is huge because if you've, you know, if you've come from Toronto or Vancouver or any of um, the other major cities, I mean, obviously they're older, but in most cases you can get around more effectively um, and more efficiently. So I think, how do we do that? Um, you know, because a lot of companies that want to move to a city, they look at things like transit. They look at things like, how do people get around? You know, what are commute times? What is affordability, as you mentioned? So um, I think it's really important that we, we look to see what we might need to, you know, amp up or change um, to make ourselves more attractive. Um, and really try to get a handle on maybe why some companies aren't moving here um, and why some people are leaving. I think people don't see this as a place of opportunity, which is so unfortunate because I think it really is. I think we've just, we've forgotten to, you know, be proud of that and talk about how many opportunities there are here. I, I agree uh, as someone from Ontario as well, who was uh, who had not traveled to Calgary since he was 10 years old for the Calgary Stampede in 1992. Uh, I, I, I can say that I did not have a idea of what Calgary was gonna be like. And when I moved here, I, I like you, you learn a lot about it and you learn how much it has to offer its residents. So I, I appreciate you answering that question and giving that backstory of it does have so much to offer everyone. Um, I, I just yet again, cautious of time here. Um, I want you to put on, I want to jump in the time machine and put yourself on October 19th, 2021. October 19th, 2021, you are the official counselor designate for Ward 11. What is priority number one for you? Priority number one is um, establishing really meaningful relationships with my fellow counselors. Um, and also with people within city administration, you know, key people within minute. That's what I do when I've started any role at any organization is figure out who people are, figure out what matters to them, figure out, you know, kind of what their working style is, um, you know, figure out who the go-to is to, you know, to solve this problem. There's always that person, you know, who knows everybody. Um, and, it, you know, when you have those relationships, all the other external things that you want to work on or you want to change or you want to improve, they become that much more easy to do because you aren't working in your own bubble. And so to me, like I said, the first thing I have done in every job I've ever had is to 
learn who people are, um, find out what they do. So find out what an average day looks like for them. Um, and, you know, really establish good relationships and understand where they're coming from. Um, because, you know, that will enable me to be able to do all the other things I need to do for the ward. Now, yet again, jump back in the time machine and put yourself in October 18th, 2022. What metrics are you going to put in place to ensure a successful first year on council? Because you will have priorities that you will want to address within the first year, because by year three, you are in election mode and year one is the most successful uh, election because you're newly elected and things will get done. What metrics are you putting in place to say, I will have a good first year if X, Y, and Z are accomplished, and I can go back to the people of Ward 11 and say, look what we've accomplished together, look what we've done in only one year as uh, Councillor Herschel? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think, I mean, hopefully I've accomplished more than one thing. Um, but I would like to see us somewhat down the road on dealing with the tax system and making it more sustainable. Um, I don't have expectations that that would necessarily be solved within a year, but I would be hoping that we'd have a framework and understanding of what might work better and that we're working with the provincial government on that. Um, and that there's actually been some headway. Um, I think, um, you know, I would like to have influenced um, looking at things like our transit system and the efficiency. I think that's going to be super important as people um, go back to working in an office and as the economy picks up and people go back to work. Um, wouldn't it be great if the transit system was kind of, you know, leveling up on par with that? Um, because that actually might change how some people, you know, get to work, right? If they're just starting to go back downtown for the first time in a while, um, and maybe they've always driven, but maybe they're open to transit because they've heard it's really efficient. And so maybe people are using transit more. Um, and to me, that's, that's a win. Um, and I think, you know, even just some very micro, but very important issues in our community. Um, we have a few areas where speeding has become a big issue um, or a perceived big issue. Um, we recently, you know, were attached to the ring road now. Um, so there's a number of roads that used to not go anywhere, um, like Southland, um, Anderson, um, well, Anderson kind of went somewhere, but, um, and then 90th, um, at this end of the ward, for example, that now attached to a ring road. And those roads drive very fast. Like, I'll be honest, like I, I drive on them and I have to be very conscious of my speed and a lot of people aren't. And there's um, a growing concern with residents about, you know, the safety of those streets. Um, there's a lot of just regular crosswalks, you know, no flashing lights and things like that. So just making sure that we've addressed those situations. I know there's similar um, concerns over in Riverbend and Douglas Glen as well with people kind of cutting through. So it's making sure people feel safe, you know, crossing the street in front of their house or sending their kids off to school on their own. I think those are, um, those are really important things that, you know, I shouldn't be waiting till the third year to address. So it's, it's that day-to-day, improvement of the day-to-day -day quality of life of the people who live in Ward 11. Perfect. Um, but in order to get to October 18th, 2022, and even October 19th, 2021, you have to be first elected. So take a moment, Correct. talk to the people of Ward 11, talk to the people who are listening to this, because some people outside of Ward 11 may want to contribute, may want to donate, may want to volunteer for you. How, uh, not how, I should ask this, why should you be the next counselor for Ward 11? Excellent question. Um, I should be the next counselor because I, I'm just, I'm very passionate about this. I work very hard. I'm smart. I figure things out. I like a good puzzle. And to me, this is, you know, the ultimate puzzle and figuring out how to move things around to, to, you know, make a better, a better picture for all of us. Um, I've got really good experience. I've worked in several different industries that have interfaced with the city. So I already have an idea of how the city works. Um, you know, where there's room for improvement, that sort of thing. So I do have some relationships established so I can hit the ground running. Um, and I'm, I'm an excellent listener. You know, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not partisan either way. Um, you know, I'm trying very hard to listen to absolutely everybody um, and, and figure out where they're coming from. And I think because of that, I think out of the 
all the candidates running in this ward, I think I would do the best job of representing everybody in the ward, um, you know, from Lakeview all the way over to Douglasdale. Um, in order to get elected, like I said, you need volunteers, 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 volunteers. Uh, you need people to come out and help door knock. How can people get involved in your campaign? How can they reach out to you to learn more? Because this is an important election and I, I want to give everyone the opportunity to pitch their social media, their website. So how can people get involved? Oh, there's lots of ways. Um, I think, you know, if you have a willingness to help um, and you go to my website and you just sign up to volunteer, there's a, there's a, support Lauren area and you can sign up to volunteer. Even if you don't know how you wanna volunteer, um, if you've never worked on a campaign before, which let's be realistic, most people have probably never worked on a campaign before. Um, there's space for you. There's a skill set you have that will help. Um, I can guarantee that. My, I worked on my first campaign um, four years ago and um, I didn't, you know, I thought I didn't have the skill set to really be of much help. And I ended up running all of the communications and, and doing a lot of other stuff. So I think it's having that willingness to help. Um, we will take you. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have an hour a month to help or if you have, you know, 30 hours a month to help. Um, there's space. So I think that's important. Um, and I have heard from people, um, which surprised me, that a lot of people don't know that you can help anybody. It doesn't matter where you live in the ward. Um, and you can donate to people who um, are running outside of your particular ward. We've had a number of people who, um, for whatever reason, thought you could only donate to people within your ward. So um, I'm not saying this just for me, but for all candidates across the city, if there's somebody you like or there's somebody that really resonates with you, um, you know, reach out and support them. Um, you know, it'll help you get to know a different part of the city. Um, but I think all candidates could use help and, um, you know, just find somebody that you feel like you can really get behind and hopefully that's me. Um, and then um, we should have an amazing council come, you know, October 18th or I guess October 19th once everything's counted. Perfect. Uh, for my listeners and to my viewers, uh, Lauren's uh, link to her website, like I said, and to her social media pages will be in the show notes. I highly recommend that you get out, get engaged, learn about the candidates who are in your ward, learn about the candidates who are running for mayor and vote, 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 vote. I'm going to stress that a lot over the next month and a half, because as this airs, I'm saying this a lot, but get out and vote. This is the future of Calgary we're talking about, and we need to do our best to make sure that it is representative of what we want. And order, in order to do that, you need to vote. Lauren, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is great.